Good evening, everyone. Good evening to our faculties and our students on today's class. And before we start today's session, we would like to give a short introduction of our first faculty, Dr. Somali Ghosh. So our faculty for today, Dr. Somali Ghosh, his design, her designation is she is a consultant and the hospital she is working in is a Apollo Clinic Girls Hospital, Kolkata. And her area of interest is chest radiology. Thank you. Dr. Ghosh, you may start sharing the slides from your end. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. My topic today is approach to chest radiograph. And uh, I'm going to stick to the very basics. I won't go into a great details. Uh, so uh, I want to start off with uh, how a chest radiograph is taken. So there is an X-ray tube and the x-rays are uh, emitted from the tube. The patient stands like this with the uh, film uh, in front of the chest and uh, the x-rays traverse from posterior to anterior. And that is how we get the PA view, which is the commonest view. But remember, PA view is only for patients who are ambulatory. They can walk around, they can come to the x-ray room, and this, this is where the x-ray is taken. Major fissure or the oblique fissure is the lower lobe. Similarly, in the left lung, there are, however, two lobes, and that is because we don't have the horizontal fissure here. We have the major fissure. So in front of the major fissure, is the left upper lobe and posterior to the major fissure is the left lower lobe. Now, when we localize a lesion, it is best not to localize by according to lobes because a lesion, say over here, would mean uh, either left upper lobe or left lower lobe, unless you're given the lateral X-ray. So it is best to localize a lesion by lung zones. Now, how are the lung zones formed? So apical zone would be anything above the clavicles. The upper zone would be below the clavicle and above the cardiac cilute. The mid zone would be level of the hyla structures and the lower zone would be the lung bases. Okay, so here you are, uh, this is, of course, a lung abscess, we can see your air fluid level in the opacity. So this is obviously in the right upper zone. Here we can also tell the lobe because the lateral x-ray has been given. So this is in the right upper lobe. Now coming to something called the silhouette sign, this often comes in very helpful to localize the lesion. Now, what is the silhouette sign? So the basic thing is that the bediastinum is white, as you can see, and the lungs are black. Now, suppose there is something white over here. Suppose there is a consolidation over here. Then this hard border is going to disappear. So when the right hard border disappears or you can't see it, that would mean a right middle lobe pathology. When you see that the right hemidiaphragm has disappeared, it would mean a right lower lobe pathology. When the right paratracheal stri stripe cannot be seen, it would mean a right upper lobe pathology. When the aortic knuckle cannot be seen, it is the left upper lobe pathology. Left hard border would mean lingula. Left hemidiaphragm would be a left lower lobe pathology. Let's look at some of the examples. So as you can see over here, we cannot see the right hard border, which should have been over here. So that is because we have a consolidation over here, which is the middle lobe, right? So we have a consolidation in the middle lobe, and that is why we cannot see the right hard border, border or it has silhouetted the right heart border. So this is an example of a silhouette sign. Again, over here, we- Thank you. Any okay. other, any Thank other you. questions, please? 
good evening ma'am uh, can you please give us some uh, details on ground glass opacities in just no ground glass opacities is something that you uh, that you talk about only in a ct scan okay that is uh, that when i take a class on ct scan that that is when i'll tell you about ground glass opacities Okay, ma'am. And uh, one more topic is uh, how can we understand about uh, pulmonary edema? See, uh, pulmonary edema, uh, the thing is, unfortunately, this class, we stuck to the very basics. We did not uh, actually discuss uh, how to uh, approach a certain... Uh, so, some basics about the CT brain. So, CT is nothing but the cross-sectional X-rays. This is possible that different tissues interact with X-rays in different way. Some tissues will allow the passage of X-rays without influencing them much, while the other will exert a more significant effect. The extent to which a material can be penetrated by an X-ray beam is described in terms of an attenuation coefficient, which assesses the how much a beam is weakened by passing through a voxel of the tissue. Means different tissue will have different attenuation value. Like as we can see here, see here that air has an attenuation value of minus 1000. So air will appear totally black on a CT. Then water has an attenuation coefficient or Hounsfield unit of zero. So it will be looking like a fluid intensity. Cerebrospinal fluid has plus 15. White matter of the brain has plus 20 to plus 30. Gray matter attenuation is slightly higher than the white matter plus 37 to plus 45. Blood or hematoma will have an attenuation of 50 or 75. 50 to 75, bone will have an attenuation of approximately 200 to plus 3000. So with this basics, keeping the basics in mind, I will show a normal CT. This is a normal CT brain. So I'm coming down slowly from the top cut. So these areas are the, remember always that very high regions are generally the parietal lobes. Then this frontal lobe starts. After that, this area is the centrum, semi-oval, and the periventricular white matter. Then as you come below, we can see this is the putamen, this is the caudate nucleus. And these are the bilateral thalamus. These are the temporal lobes. These are all our temporal lobes. Now, when you the next thing we should see is, is to look for a bone window. Bone window will show us the whether there is any fracture or not. So, as you can see here, there is a linear fracture in the left parietal bone that is extending inferiorly. We can see it in the VR projection, the fracture beautifully. So, now, again, I am showing the cases again because this is very important to differentiate. So, this case 5, we have a MRG collection, extraction MRG collection that is in, that is a crescentic shape. So, this is a subdural hemorrhage. And in the case 6, we have an hemorrhage which is of lentiform shape and it is limited by the suture. So, it is a case of Extradural hemorrhage. An extradural hemorrhage which may need an urgent decompression while a subdural hemorrhage may wait depending on the mass effect and the patient's clinical condition. So it's very important to differentiate between the EDH and the SDH. EDH is always a lenticular shaped hemorrhage while SDH is crescentic shape. EDH will be limited by suture and will uh, SDH will cross the suture. Classically, extradural hematoma occurs due to the injury of the middle meningeal artery. Classically, subdural hematoma occurs due to the tearing of subdural cortical bridging brain, which extends to the dural sinuses. So, you can remember with this sign. So, extradural hematoma, it will be lenticular shaped or the apple shape, while the subdural hemat lemon shape, while the subdural hematoma will be crescentic collection or it will look, look like the shape of a banana. So, coming to my next case, this is a 40 year old female presenting with severe headache for three days after delivery and is having generally tonic clonic seizure. So initially it was, she underwent a cesarean section and it was uh, thought that it is because of the post epidural puncture headache. However, one CT was done for her and see the CT carefully. There is a subarachnoid hemorrhage in the pre-medullary and the pre-pontine cisterns. 
एज वेल एज ब्लड इन दिस फोर्थ वेंटिकल और फोर्थ वेंटिकुलर हेमरेज एंड देर इज ऑल्सो साबरक्रॉन हेमरेज इन दायलेट्रल सीरबियन फिशन एंड इंटरवेंटिकुलर हेमरेज इन दी ऑक्सीपिटल हॉर्न ऑफ बायोलेट्रल लैटरल वेंटिकल so when post contrast sequences remember post contrast sequences are always t1 t1 sequences so it is a t1 sequence that has been acquired so as i can slowly go up you can see the brain parenchyma is started with multiple ring enhancing conglomerate lesions in the bilateral frontal lobe and some lesion which are not well seen on the flare on other sequences so you can see here around the supracellular cystern along the anterior intermediate fissure near the cilian fissure so this all represents a classic case of conglomerating multiple cns tuberculoma coming to my second case this is a 6 year old female with a generalized tonic clonic seizure so in this patient as you can see there is a lesion with surrounding edema but look at the lesion carefully there is a That lesion. This is a T2 sequence. This is a flare, and this is a T1 sequence. In T2 sequence, there is a subtle. This lesion appears. The entire lesion appears cystic or bright, but there is a hypointense structure within the cyst. This is a dark structure within the entire bright cyst. So this is another sequence uh, specifically done for this pathology. This is called C sort drive sequence, which is a heavily tituated sequence, which shows this dark thing beautifully in this lesion. and susceptibility this is the gradient echo sequence which also shows this hypointense structure which is showing blooming on the gradient echo images and on the post contrast images the lesion is showing thick nodular ring enhancement so this is a classic case of neurocystic sarcosis and the hypointense structure as we can see here is called the uscolex this is pathognomonic of neurocystic sarcosis and this lesion is in the colloidal vesicular stage coming to my third case this is a 6 year old female patient with fever right hemiparesis she has a history of a cyanotic heart disease tetralogy of fallot so in this case we can see a well defined lesion which is again this is a t2 sequence you can see the csf between the sulcal spaces t2 hyperintense lesion with surrounding edema this partially the lesion signal is suppressed on the flare sequence now this is the diffusion weighted image c this lesion is showing intense diffusion restriction on the diffusion weighted image it is appearing so bright on the adc map it is appearing so dark so the intense diffusion restriction is present in this lesion this is the t1 sequence non contrast and this is the post contrast t1 sequence in post contrast t1 sequence we can see a peripheral enhancement with central areas of non enhancement so this is a classic case of a pyogenic cerebral abscess so coming to my next case this is a 45 year old female with excuse me with history of right hemiparesis fever she had a past history of pot spine and was on treatment with att and steroids so again see this lesion this is a t2 hyperintense lesion which is located in the left basal ganglia and the left frontal lobe the lesion is appearing a flare iso to mildly hyperintense you can see the surrounding edema in this lesion the diffusion is not as homogeneous as an abscess in this lesion this is a some part is showing diffusion some part is not showing diffusion restriction some part we can see increased vesicogenic uh, uh, edema also so these areas are showing patchy areas of diffusion restriction as seen now this is the susceptibility weighted images which shows some tiny hemorrhages along the wall of the lesion this is the t1 non contrast images and this is the t2 post contrast images so you can see this undulation along the i begin the ortho series i'm dr srijita from kolkata and my topic is basically a very very basic topic i am not going to show you a series of you know uh, your various student, entities uh, it's not about entities getting, it's not uh, about spotters it's a, all about an approach now it is all right how now to read a bone now, radiograph now a bone uh, radiograph is all hello. about so audio and video are coming white okay, and various okay. shades of gray Then, it's not really pretty dull colors but that's why i try i'm trying to make this session a bit colorful a bit different and this background of my introductory slides suggest that i
I'll try to give you an approach. Students, let me tell you, whatever you're reporting, whether it's a CT, whether it's an MR, if you have an algorithm in your mind, if you have an approach in your mind, if you follow certain steps mentally before putting it into writing, you will produce a report which is way far different from any of your colleagues. And my idea about this session is on how you should approach what are the questions that should come into mind when a bone radiograph is kept in front of you, whether for your viva, whether for your day-to-day -day practice, before you write something clinically pertinent so that the clinician who has asked you to report it always has a tendency of reading what you've written other than, you know, just ignoring a report, say this is all absolutely you know nonsense. And I just believe on my interpretation. Why should it be that? Your writing should be such that it should be clinically pertinent. So I have divided my lecture as, uh, by answering six questions. The questions are, number one, what is the density pattern of structures that we see in a bone radiograph? What parts of a bone can we study in a bone radiograph? Target the things written in red. Those are the things which should be finally imprinted in your mind at the end of the lecture. Whose bone am I seeing? Is it a pediatric patient, an adult patient, and a geriatric patient? Why? Because it's the same mechanism of, of injury or whatever, same mechanism and etiology will produce a different picture in children versus adults versus elderly. Next, which bone am I seeing? Are these bones a part of a joint? If so, whether they are a part of small joint or large joint? The most important question, question number five, why have I been asked to study this radiograph? What is the clinical suspicion? Is my report going to answer that suspicion? Is it going to narrow down the DD or is it going to further confuse the clinician? And lastly, have I just looked at the bones and finished uh, interpreting? interpretation or have I looked at the nook and corner of the radiograph looking outside the bones and completed my study. Before I begin, I just want to tell you all exam going students, if you are kept, if an x-ray radiograph is kept in front of you, don't just say x-ray shoulder. The thing is, we are not dealing with an x-ray, we are dealing with a radiograph or an x-ray film. So the terminology of x-ray film or radiograph sounds better than this is an x-ray of a humerus. X-ray is something, an ionizing radiation just passing through our body. So just keep it in mind. If you can use the term radiograph x-ray film, it is better. Coming to number one, what is the density pattern in a bone radiograph? Density pattern of structures in a bone radiograph. Andrew felt sorry for cursing mammography. Air, fat, soft tissue, calcium, metal. On one end is air and one end is metal. So uh, write a beautiful clinically pertinent report, which is going to stand apart from the rest of your colleagues. Just my last two slides to end, to give you an example how the algorithm that I said helps. This was one of my final FRCR cases. The, I'm sorry for the quality of the uh, picture. The picture that was given to me in my examination was much more brighter. And in these exams, you are just given the radiograph and asked to speak, and you just have to go on speaking. So what are the bones that we are seeing? This is not exactly bones. This is a chest radiograph. We are seeing the chest, the bones. We see the spine. We see the clavicle. We see the ribs. We see the bones over here. On the question number one, yes, we see unfused epiphysis. We are dealing with a child. Now. Next, I asked, what is the clinic? What is the clinical? I mean, what is the clinical uh, issue? Why are we uh, uh, doing this? Why are we are being asked to read the radio, radiograph? This patient is a patient, a known patient of lymphoma, has come with severe cough and high fever and generalized body pain. Are we seeing any lung parenchymal lesion to explain the fever? No. Everything looks quite okay. The bones also, when I saw intricately in details, no, I'm not finding anything uh, very remarkable. Go to the penumbra. It will give you an, just an example. Go to the penumbra. Look at the axilla. Look at the axilla. See the soft tissue swelling over here. Do we expect it in a normal patient? No, these are the enlarged nodes. Just to show you that, yes, this is a lymphoma patient with axillary bilateral. Thank you, ma'am, for this wonderful video.